Today on The Hookup, it's time for part two of my ultimate secure smart home network series. In part one, I walked you through hardware selection using Unify equipment, and in today's video, I'm gonna show you how to get your network set up using cybersecurity best practices, including VLANs, wireless networks, and firewall rules, as well as explaining all the advanced options in the Unify 6.0 controller. In part three, I'll finish it up with wireless signal optimization, port security, intrusion prevention, and VPNs. This turned out to be the longest video that I've ever made, and if you watch the whole thing, I guarantee you'll learn something new. But I've also got timestamps and chapter markers down in the description if you're interested in one specific topic. Before we get started, I think it's important to mention that convenience and security are opposing ideals. Whether you're talking about physical security or cybersecurity, the outcome is the same. Most increases in security will also come with a decrease in convenience. Leaving your doors unlocked saves you time and effort when coming home, but at the cost of your home security and your personal peace of mind. The same goes for your network. The goal is always to minimize this trade-off using technology, but whether it's increased setup time, decreased network speed, or even loss of some functionality, you're gonna to need to decide where you want your network to fall on the continuum of convenience versus security. I'm gonna show you my whole setup, which I would put closer to the secure side than the convenient side, but you can pick and choose the parts that you think are the most important for your setup. This video is sponsored by ZemiSmart and their new no assembly motorized curtain system. The adjustable motorized curtain rod can accommodate window openings from 67 inches all the way up to 157 inches and can be installed within minutes by sliding the adjustable tracks to your desired size and plugging it into a nearby outlet. The curtains connect via Wi-Fi to the Tuya Smart Life app, giving you Amazon Echo and Google Home Control, as well as allowing you to integrate them easily into your smart home hub. Check out the assembly-free motorized curtain rod from ZemiSmart using the links down in the description. In the Internet of Things, device communication can be really complicated, but for the most part, IoT devices can be divided up into four main categories. Devices that need to communicate with a cloud service outside your network, devices that only communicate inside your local network, devices that need to talk to a cloud service and devices on your local network, and last, devices that don't need any outbound communication at all and should only speak when spoken to. For example, my Sense Energy Monitor collects data about the electrical usage in my house and it sends that data to the cloud. When I open up the app on my phone, I'm not actually talking to the device in my house, I'm communicating with the cloud as a middleman. Similarly, when I use that energy data in my home automation platform, the energy monitor doesn't talk to the hub despite the fact that they're only 20 feet away from each other. Instead, they use the cloud as an intermediate. This means that my Sense Energy Monitor falls into the IoT class, which should be allowed to communicate with the internet, but blocked from all local communication. My Amazon Echo devices are very similar in that they're communicating with the Amazon Cloud 99% of the time, but they do need to talk to each other in order to synchronize multi-room audio. And they need to talk to my Home Assistant server in order to process Alexa local devices in Node-RED. So even though they're in the IoT class, I'm also gonna to need to set up additional custom rules to allow them to communicate with one another and with my Home Assistant server. As a general rule of thumb, I try to avoid cloud devices and choose local control whenever possible. But anything that utilizes a service, be it Netflix, Disney Plus, or even the Amazon Cloud, unfortunately can't operate 100% locally. And that brings me to my next device class, which is all the locally controlled devices on my network. This includes all the smart switches that I've flashed with custom Tasmoda firmware and my Shelly's, which have local control options on their own. These devices don't need any internet access and only need to communicate with my home automation server. I call these things my network of things, or NOT, because they only need to communicate within the local network. Similar to the IoT network, they don't really need to communicate with each other either, so I can block all of their traffic except for communication to my home assistant server. If you're not sure whether your device should be on your IoT or your NOT, you can just unplug your internet connection and see if it still works. If it does, it's NOT. If not, IoT. Next are devices that should be able to access anything on the network. Cybersecurity best practices actually says that this device class shouldn't exist, and that if a device needs this kind of access, it should be temporarily elevated to a higher privilege to complete a task, and then returned back down to a lower privilege state. However, as I mentioned, in an effort to increase convenience, I keep all of my family's phones, computers, and tablets on this main untagged VLAN. 
but a little later we'll talk about how security features like intrusion prevention systems may help mitigate some of the possible vulnerabilities in these devices. Another questionable decision that I've made on my network for practical reasons is to put all of my completely untrusted devices onto my main untagged VLAN. Here I'm specifically talking about security cameras, which are ironically one of the most insecure devices from a cybersecurity standpoint. The way that a security camera works is that each one has a little video server running on the camera itself. If a device like an NVR wants to view that feed, it contacts the camera and it initiates the stream. There's no reason for a device outside my network to initiate a camera stream and no reason for the camera itself to initiate that connection with another device. So I can block 100% of their outbound traffic via firewall rules without affecting their functionality at all. The reason for putting them on the same untagged VLAN as the server is that it really reduces the strain on the router to not have to pass 11 5 to 8 megapixel video streams across VLANs from each camera to the NVR. Now, just having them on the untagged VLAN doesn't represent any security flaw, since they're going to have a corresponding firewall rule. The real problem is that it represents poor network port security. An easy way to get full, unlimited access to my network would be to tear one of my security cameras off the wall, unplug the Ethernet cable, and then plug it into your device. Because the security camera group is defined by their IP address, which is ultimately assigned by their MAC address, a new device would just pull a fresh IP and then therefore not be bound by the camera firewall rule. Thankfully, there is more than one way to secure a network, so we're going to deal with this issue using port restrictions later on. Now that we've talked through the theory behind the network architecture, let's see how to actually implement these policies in the new Unify 6.0 controller interface and dashboard. The first thing that I did on my Unify Dream Machine Pro was to set up a local admin account and disable cloud access. To do this, click on Users from the UDM local portal, then either make a new super admin local user or add local credentials to your cloud account. If you want, you can also completely disable cloud access to your Unify controller by going to Settings, then Advanced, and then toggle the Remote Access switch to Off. It's unfortunately still not possible to do the initial activation and setup of the UDM Pro without a Ubiquiti account, but at least you can move back to local control once it's installed. After you've logged into your UDM with your new local credentials, click on the network button and if you're on controller version 6.0, your dashboard should look something like this. If not, you can go to settings, user interfaces, and then toggle the new dashboard and new settings switches. You can try out new clients as well, but I personally don't like it since it's missing important information like which access point each device is connected to. For the time being, you can still easily toggle between the new and old settings menus if you can't find the setting you need in the new menus. The first thing that we need to set up are the networks, and we're going to start with those three different virtual networks within our single physical network. To set these up, go to Networks and click on Add New Network. My first network will be my IoT network, and after adding the name, you'll see that all the other important settings are now in the Advanced tab. My IoT network is going to be assigned to VLAN 20, and it isn't associated with a domain name. The next option in the list is for Device Isolation, which sounds great and exactly what we would want for our IoT network. However, I'm not going to use it, because even though this likely turns on some internal firewall rule, that firewall rule doesn't show up in the interface anywhere, so it's impossible to allow exceptions properly since we don't know whether the rule is being applied at the beginning or the end of the chain. The next option is IGMP snooping, which is a feature that specifically applies to multicast communications. To understand the different types of network traffic, let's use Twitter as a model. On Twitter, you can send private messages to a single other Twitter user, and they can respond in that direct channel. In networking, we would call this unicast. Another way that you can interact with people is to follow them, and then they can send out tweets that will go to all of their followers. They aren't necessarily talking directly to you, but you've indicated that you might be interested in what they're talking about. In networking, we call this multicast, and IGMP is the protocol that's used to figure out who is following who so that when a computer sends out a multicast message, it only gets delivered to the interested parties. There's also another type of communication called broadcast that's much more like the announcements that Twitter makes that you don't have any option but to look at. However, broadcast is a pretty complicated topic, so for now, let's just focus on multicast. As I said, IGMP is the method that your devices use to indicate that they want to receive another device's multicasts. The problem is that by design, multicast only works within the same network, and since we have three separate virtual networks, the devices on one VLAN have no way to follow the devices on another VLAN.
However, if we enable IGMP snooping, the router looks at the type of traffic that each device is interested in, and then it sends that same type of traffic from other VLANs in addition to the local VLAN traffic. However, there is a problem. If the VLAN that you're assigned to doesn't have any of that multicast traffic that you're interested in, then the router will never know that you want to see it. This is getting confusing. Let me give you an example. All of my Chromecast devices are on my IoT network. They need to be able to talk to the internet to stream all their services, but I also want to be able to cast from my PC to the Chromecast. When I click on the cast button on my computer, it will generate a list of available devices based on the multicast messages that the Chromecast sends out, basically saying, hey, I'm available as a casting target. If I put a Chromecast device on the same VLAN as my computer, then my computer would join that IGMP group and it would hear all the messages from the Chromecast on other VLANs. But since there are no Chromecasts on the same network as my computer, then my computer never joins that IGMP group and IGMP snooping doesn't know to send the messages from the IoT VLAN to my computer. Look, that was a really long-winded way of saying that if you have devices on your network that advertise services like casting, over-the-air updates, or voice assistant integration, then you may need to turn IGMP snooping off as well as turning on the MDNS repeater which you do by clicking on Settings, Advanced Features, Advanced Gateway Settings, and then Multicast DNS. Next, you'll need to set up a subnet for your VLAN. I like to keep my subnet on the same VLAN number, meaning if I put it as VLAN 20, I want my gateway and subnet to be 192.168.20.1/24. The slash 24 part at the end refers to how much of the IP address will be the same for the entire subnet. 24 means the first 24 bits are part of the address, and the last 8 bits will vary based on the device. Another way that you've probably seen this is called a subnet mask, which in this case would be 255.255.255.0, meaning the first three 8-bit numbers are part of the network address, and the last 8-bit number is part of the client address. Unify is doing their best to make sure that users don't need to understand all of this stuff, so they give you the option to auto-calculate your subnet. They also give you the option to auto scale the size of your network as needed, which I think is really strange, and I can't think of any reason why you'd want to do this. But as far as the DHCP range is concerned, there are some reasons that you might not want all 254 addresses in your DHCP range. IP addresses need to be unique for each device on your network, and they can be assigned in a few different ways. The most common way is for a device to request an IP address from your router, which is called DHCP. And in this case, the router looks up all the IP addresses that are currently being used and it assigns a free IP address from the range that you define. The second way is called a DHCP reservation, in which you tell your DHCP server, which is the Dream Machine Pro in this case, that you want to always give a specific IP address to a specific device based on its MAC address. Every time that device attempts to connect to your network, it will ask for an IP address like normal, but the Dream Machine Pro will always give it the same IP address and it will never give that address to another device. The third and final way is called a static IP address, and that's where the device itself defines its IP address, and it tells the router what its address is instead of asking. Static IPs can lead to issues if they're outside of your defined subnet or if that address is already taken by another device. A common way to avoid these IP conflicts is to start your DHCP range above 100. This will give you roughly 153 DHCP IP addresses and 94 static IP addresses. However, on my network, almost all of my devices will use DHCP and DHCP reservations, so I prefer to keep my DHCP range large and then reserve IP addresses in the router for any device that I want to have the same IP address for every time it joins the network. The rest of the options are going to be specific to your setup. I personally specify the DNS servers that I like my devices to use so that it doesn't default to my service provider's DNS server. I use Cloudflare's DNS at 1.1.1.1 as my primary server and Google's DNS at 8.8.8.8 as my secondary. I also define my own network time protocol server since I run the crony add-on in my home assistant server. This helps me keep NTP requests local so I can block more outbound traffic via the firewall. After you've changed any extra network settings for your specific network, go ahead and hit save and then repeat that same process for your NOT network. Except this time you'll specify the VLAN as 30 and the gateway and subnet as 192.168.30.1/24. Remember, if you want all the multicast data from this network to be repeated on your other VLANs, then you should disable IGMP snooping on this network.
Last, you may want or need to change your default LAN network to a different subnet if you already have a bunch of devices set up using that IP address. To do this, click on the pencil icon to edit, and then edit the gateway and subnet addresses as needed. Unify has also added the ability to designate a network as a work or family network. These networks work similar to all other network types, but they use a special domain name server or DNS. In this special family and work network, the Dream Machine uses its own forwarding DNS server, which sends all adult sites into something that's called a DNS black hole, which basically just makes the sites show up as unresponsive. Additionally, the Dream Machine's DNS can also redirect Google and YouTube traffic into their safe mode subdomains in order to filter out explicit material and turn off comments. This isn't new tech at all, and it's been relatively easy to implement in the past using popular software called Pihole. Since I have an eight-year-old, I decided to give this a shot. So I set up a fourth network called Family, and then I'll show you how to force specific wired devices onto that network later on. Unfortunately, using this implementation, the only way to get a wireless device into this content-controlled network is to define a specific wireless network for it. Speaking of wireless networks, now that we've got our networks defined, we need to assign them to those wireless networks. The way that I've divided up my network, I know that my IoT and NOT devices are stationary and should be connecting to a specific access point on a specific frequency band. For this reason, I've broken out my SSIDs not only into IoT and NOT, but also into the area where the devices are located, downstairs, upstairs, or outside. In the old Unify controller, I accomplished this with SSID overrides on each access point. But that feature has gone away, and the new method is to use Wi-Fi groups. To make these Wi-Fi groups, you need to start configuring a Wi-Fi network. So in settings, click Wi-Fi and then add Wi-Fi network, and then click on advanced. Each Wi-Fi group needs to have at least one access point associated with it, but it can include as many as you want. I'll make a group for upstairs, downstairs, and outside that contain only a single access point. And then there's also a group that contains all the access points for my roaming devices. For each wireless network, I'll use the same base name, in this case, Tate IoT or Tate NOT, and then I'll use an underscore followed by its location. For instance, my outside NOT network is called Tate NOT underscore outside, and I'll assign that specifically to the NOT network and to my outside access point group. It's also helpful to disable any unused radios for these networks. For instance, I know that my outside NOT group only contains 2.4 GHz devices, so there's no reason to broadcast this SSID on the 5 GHz channel. Disabling unused SSIDs will help reduce interference and decrease the number of beacon messages being sent out by each access point. Next are the advanced features. If I have one main gripe with Unify, it's that a lot of their options are vague and require a decent amount of digging to figure out what they actually do. And even then, sometimes there's no official documentation for them. A general rule of thumb for any advanced feature is to turn it on and see if any of your devices respond negatively. And if they do, turn it back off. That being said, here are some basic explanations of these features and what they do. Unscheduled automatic power save delivery allows devices to tell your access point that they want to save battery. And any data meant for that device in power saving mode will be stored up for a short period of time and then delivered all at once instead of having a constant stream of data to the device. This allows the device to turn off its Wi-Fi radio for a longer period of time, therefore saving battery without missing information or being disconnected from the network. In theory, you should be able to enable this feature without any issue, but your specific devices will need to support UAPSD to see any benefits. And as I said, if you enable it and you see issues with older devices, you can safely turn it off. Next is multicast enhancement, the first of the really cryptic options. From what I can tell, this is just a place to enable IGMP v3, which is how devices join multicast groups as we discussed before. I have multicast enabled on all of my networks and I've never seen an issue with it. It's oddly disabled by default, but like I said, I've never had an issue. Forcing high performance devices onto the five gigahertz network means that if a device supports five gigahertz, it only gets to use five gigahertz, even if the 2.4 gigahertz signal is stronger, which is a bad plan because of attenuation issues with the five gigahertz band. I'd say the only reason to use this is if you have an open air office with lots of cubicles where every device has a direct line of sight to the access point. Even then, I'm not sure. Keep it off for home use. BSS Transition monitors the signal strength of your devices and sends a special management frame to weak signal devices, telling them that they may want to transition to a different access point. 
This feature should absolutely be disabled on all the networks that are using a single access point, since even a weak signal device shouldn't try to roam to a different access point. I do have this feature enabled on my main Wi-Fi network that I use for phones and tablets. Proxy ARP should be off for 99% of networks, and if you need to turn it on, you probably already know what it means. Layer 2 isolation means that your access points don't even check firewall rules before denying communication between devices on the same network. This is useful for a guest network, but it should be off for all your other networks. Legacy support will allow really old devices that use 802.11b to connect to your network. Remember that adding these older, slower devices will increase the time that all of your devices need to wait to talk to your access point, which not only slows them down, but it might also cause connectivity issues. Unless you have a specific, very old device that you absolutely can't live without, you should keep legacy support off. Last is enable fast roaming, and similarly to the BSS transition frames, you're going to want to keep this setting off for all of your networks except for your main roaming network. On my main network, I have only laptops, phones, and tablets, which can all use fast roaming. But if you do notice connectivity issues when changing locations in your house, you should shut this feature off. Under security, you should have WPA2 default enabled and hide SSID off. For PMFs, you should have either optional or disabled. PMFs or protected management frames mean that only authenticated devices can send frames that instruct clients to associate, disconnect, or roam. It seems crazy, but the way that Wi-Fi was originally designed, any device can tell another device to disconnect from the network, even without knowing the Wi-Fi password. This leads to one of the most common attacks on Wi-Fi networks that's called a deauth attack, where a single device sends out thousands of these deauthorization management frames to disconnect every device in range. Protected management frames are great, and they're going to help provide much more secure connections in the future. But as of right now, there's just not enough devices that support them to set this feature as required. And I've even had some trouble with my ESP8266 based devices if I set it to optional. Keep your group rekey interval set to the default. This next section also has MAC filtering, which allows you to deny or allow specific devices based on their MAC address. I had an Amazon Echo Show that I temporarily switched onto my main network to record part of a video, and even after switching it back to my IoT network, it would occasionally show up on my main network, even though I told it to forget it. To prevent this, I added its MAC address to the deny list of my main network, which prevents it from ever joining again. This last section allows you to turn off your Wi-Fi network based on specific times of day. I personally don't find this useful in my setup, especially since the Unify integration for Home Assistant lets you shut off the internet access for just one specific device. So I don't specify a schedule in this section, but if you had a specific kids network, you could turn off Wi-Fi to that network after a specific time. Remember that you'll need to create separate Wi-Fi networks for each VLAN and access point if you want to force the devices onto a specific access point based on their location. Each access point can only broadcast four different SSIDs. So with a main, IoT, and NOT, and guest network, you're going to be maxed out. Once you're done with that, it's time to move on to the next step, which is the most important one for the security of your network. Firewall rules, or what are sometimes called access control lists, or ACLs, are the main system that governs whether devices will be able to communicate with each other or the outside world. Best practice in network security is a concept that's called zero trust, or similarly least privilege, which basically means that you should start by blocking all traffic to every device on your network, and then only grant specific access to the devices when they need it. In the Unify controller, Firewall rules are processed from the top down. That means that if traffic is specifically allowed by a rule at the top of the list, then no other rules will be checked to see if they apply. Because of this, I find it easiest to put specific allow rules at the top of the list and then generic deny rules at the bottom. If you're using a firewall other than Unify, make sure yours operates the same way before blindly following this tutorial. Otherwise, you could lock yourself out of your network completely by using too broad of deny rules. Speaking of other firewalls, another issue when dealing with multiple vendors is knowing the built-in implicit rules. Unify uses implicit allow for all local networks and implicit deny for your external connection. This means that if you don't make a firewall rule specifically denying it, all local traffic will be allowed between VLANs on your local network. And similarly, if you don't make a specific allow rule, all incoming traffic from external sources will be blocked. Different vendors will have different built-in policies, like using implicit deny between VLANs, but Unify does allow VLAN to VLAN traffic by default. You can view all these built-in rules in the firewall section where they show up as ghosted text and cannot be edited. On my network, I use Home Assistant, Plex Media Server, Amazon Echoes with multi-room audio, Chromecasts, and Rokus. 
I'll set up my rules based on these devices, but if you use other services like Sonos for instance, you'll need to figure out which ports they need. And if you use a service that isn't covered in this video and figure out a firewall rule to make them work, go ahead and post it as a comment down below and not only will I check it for potential security flaws, but I'll favorite it so other people can find and use that rule if they need it. All right, the first firewall rule that we need to make is one called allow established and related. This means that if device A has permission to talk to device B, then device B will be allowed to answer, even if device B isn't allowed to initiate the conversation on its own. Lots of people commented on my last video that established and related is built into the Unify firewall. But as you can see, it only exists in the internet in and internet local areas. So that doesn't apply to LAN traffic. To make a LAN based established and related rule, click on create new rule, select LAN in, call it allow established and related, and then apply it before all other rules. You should accept any protocol and then down at the bottom under advanced, you'll activate match state established and match state related and then hit apply. A surefire way to cause issues with any device is to block it from getting the correct time. Using incorrect time can make it impossible to use encryption properly and may cause some devices to just stop working entirely. For this reason, I let all of my devices have access to the network time protocol or NTP, which communicates on port 123. Click on New Rule, then select LAN In. Next, give it a descriptive name. I'm going to call mine Allow All Local to NTP. We want this rule to be applied before all other rules, and we want it to accept traffic that meets a certain criteria. Remember, these are accept rules, so you should make them as specific as you can. I happen to know that the network time protocol uses UDP, so I'll specifically only allow UDP packets. Under source type, I want to use a group of IP addresses. So I'll select the address slash port group, and then in IP group, I'll select create new group, and I'll create a group called all local IP addresses. That group is going to contain all the IP addresses inside of my network, which are 192.168.86.0 24, 30.0 24, 2.0 24, and 20.0 24. After entering all those IP addresses, hit create new group, and then make sure it's selected in the dropdown. You can define a single port using the IP address dropdown option, but I like to make groups for everything so that they're more descriptive. Click create new group, then name it NTP port and put in port 123. The next rule to configure will allow my IoT devices to communicate with my home assistant server. Depending on the type of device you have on your network, you might not need this rule at all. This rule is obviously only necessary if you're using a home assistant server and only if the devices that you're using are listed as local push. If they're listed as local pulling, then home assistant only needs to be able to communicate with them, which by default it can because it's on the main untagged VLAN, which we're giving unlimited network access to. If your device is listed as cloud pulling or cloud push, then the local devices don't need to access the home assistant server at all since they're going to use the cloud as an intermediate. The broadest setup of this rule should be LAN in, applied before, accepting all, from source IoT to destination home assistant server. I only have one home assistant server, but again, I like to make a group that has just one IP address so the firewall rules are more descriptive. To follow that concept of least privilege, you could make a group of IP addresses that need to use local push instead of using the entire IoT network as the source. The fewer permissions that you give, the more secure your network will be. Remember that anytime you add a device to one of these IP address based groups, you should also reserve that IP for that device using the unified dashboard. This not only ensures that your device will take the same IP each time it connects to the network, but it will also prevent another device from getting that IP address and therefore having more permissions than it should. My next rule is to allow my NOT network to communicate with Home Assistant. In my previous video, I limited this rule to only MQTT traffic, but with all the new integrations and protocols used by Home Assistant for things like Shelly Discovery and WLED and ESP Home, I'm recommending just giving the NOT network full access to Home Assistant on any port rather than just specific MQTT ports. For this rule, you should choose LAN in, apply before, allow all protocols, and then for the source, it should be the NOT network and the destination should be your Home Assistant server, port group any. If this rule is too broad for you, you could define more specific groups of devices within your NOT, but for me, all of my NOT devices are communicating with Home Assistant in some way, so this makes sense. My Amazon Echo devices are on the IoT network, which means they can't communicate with any devices locally. However, I figured out that for multi-room audio to work correctly, the Echo devices need to be able to communicate with each other. So I'll make a specific firewall rule called Echo to Echo in the LAN in area. 
I'll apply it before the other rules, allow all protocols, and then I'll use a source group of my Echo devices and a destination group of my Echo devices. Chromecast devices need some specific ports open for communication, so I'll add a rule called Chromecast, which will be in the LAN in, and I'll apply it before the other rules. I'll allow all protocols with a source of the IP addresses of my Chromecast group and a destination of any device on the network that I want to be able to cast from on these seven Chromecast specific ports. On my network, all the casting happens from devices on the main untagged VLAN, but if you want to limit which devices you can cast from, you can make a smaller IP address based group just for casting. Also, a quick note, I've noticed that Chromecast streaming functionality is significantly increased by disabling IGMP snooping on the IoT VLAN like we discussed earlier. My last allow rule is to give my streaming media devices access to my Plex server. For this rule, I'll choose LAN in, apply before, allow TCP and UDP with a source of the IP address based group called the streaming media devices and a destination of my Plex media server, specifically on these 10 ports required for Plex and its different services. At this point, my firewall is exactly the same as we started since all I've done is make allow rules and the unified LAN uses implicit allow, meaning all the traffic was allowed anyways. So to secure my network, I'm now going to make those broad deny rules for each network. My IoT devices shouldn't be able to communicate with any devices on my network. So since I already created a group called all local addresses, I can make a new rule called drop IoT from local, choose LAN in, apply after other rules, and then drop all traffic with a source of the IoT network and a destination of all local IP addresses. If I ever need to add an additional VLAN, I just need to remember to add that into the all local IP addresses group. My NOT devices shouldn't be able to communicate with any devices at all other than my home assistant server. So I'll make a rule called drop all NOT, choose LAN in, apply after and deny all traffic with a source of NOT and a destination of any IP and any port. Last, I'll make a similar deny all rule for my security camera group. I'll do LAN in, apply after, Drop all traffic with a source of my IP address based security camera group where I've reserved their IP addresses via DHCP. And then the destination should be any IP address in any port. As I said before, firewall rules are read from the top down and it's kind of a sudden death scenario where the first time a packet matches the conditions of a rule, that rule is applied and then no other rules are checked. So each time a packet comes through, it will check to see if it matches any of the specific allow rules, and if not, it will be denied by the generic deny rules. There is a theoretical speed increase to be had by putting rules that apply to the most common types of traffic higher up on the list, but in practice on a home network, there's just no reason to stress about this, as long as the allow rules come before the deny rules. Even though firewall rules are the most important tool for securing your network, there are loads of other features in the Dream Machine Pro that provide additional layers of security. In part three of this series, I'll cover intrusion prevention systems, port security, and setting up your own virtual private network to avoid exposing services on your network to the internet. If you learned something new today, make sure you hit that thumbs up button so YouTube knows it's a good video and will suggest it to other people. Thank you so much to my awesome patrons over at Patreon for your continued support of my channel. If you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out the links down in the description. If you enjoy this video, please consider subscribing. And as always, thanks for watching The Hookup.